Hello and welcome to week 11 of LAT 2150. Uh, my name is Todd Hurley. I'm your instructor for the class. Um, this week we're going to talk about information exchange. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, um, information exchange chapter 11 in Raymond Foster's book uh, Police Technology. Uh, we'll get through the first couple slides here. Assignments, uh, this, this uh, is a page that you see quite frequently so we won't uh, talk about discussion boards. There's one discussion board this week. I had to calendar flip there a little bit but um, so just remember one discussion board this uh, due this week. So the learning objectives for this week are one, uh, the value of information exchange between state, local, and federal, federal agencies. We'll talk about the importance of that. Um, the issue of interoperability, um, which is interoperability, which is created by um, the fragmentation that occurs in law enforcement um, agencies, the various factors that make up information exchange difficult, and some of the potential solutions to information exchange. Um, those are the learning objectives for this week's class, or this week's lecture. Um, as an introduction here, we're going to look at information exchange uh, from the point of view of two, the exchange of two different types of information, tactical and strategic information. You know, we've covered this in the in previous uh, uh, week's lectures. Tactical information is information that's used at the time of an event, uh, you know, information that, that could help um, in the actions that need to be taken at, at a particular event. Strategic information is typically information that is used for long-term or strategic planning. Um, so those, those are the two types of information, and we'll look at the information exchange with respect or from those two perspectives. Um, definition of inter integration, a completely integrated criminal justice system would be a network designed to provide each agency from the police to the courts to the prison systems with information needed to make decisions. So a completely integration, excuse me, a completely integrated system is going to be one that is integrated from the very beginning, and the very beginning of that process is the police departments, law enforcement agencies, through the court systems, and ultimately carry into the uh, penal system or the the um, uh, prison system. Uh, the importance of integration, interoperability, is the process of connecting different agencies or units. Um, with agencies using communications technologies so that they communicate directly. So uh, a system that is completely inter uh, interoperable is going to be one that, that they can, op uh, or can communicate via uh, radio systems, data systems. Um, so you know, that is uh, uh, com the importance of integration. If you can imagine um, you know, being on a scene or being in a, a um, multi-jurisdictional uh, incident where not being able to communicate with the other jurisdictions, the, the difficulties that are created in, the, in those situations. Um, tactical importance of integration. So tactical information is used to make immediate decisions. Incorrect or incomplete information can cause poor decisions. So the, the inability to share um, tactical information um, is critically dangerous. So again, looking at a larger event or even an event that just caught, crosses from one jurisdiction to the other, not to being able to coordinate um, that, that event, um, you know, say a car chase and here kind of what the, the, the picture alludes to, not being able to coordinate uh, a tactical event like uh, that that is, that is occurring across jurisdictional lines you know, not being able to, to you know, ra radio ahead and say, you know, you know, lay down spike strips or uh, barricade, those kinds of things. Um, so that's, you can see how not having the ability for that integration would be, would be um, uh, dangerous. Strategic information. Um, strategic information is generally used to make long-term or more deliberate decisions. Incorrect or incomplete uh, information can cause poor decisions. The inability to share critical information is dangerous. Again, so again, thinking about you know uh, making long-term strategic um, decisions based on false information. So you know it's not so much that you know it's you're making decisions based on uh, others' jurisdictions, but if you know as as many of you know, um, crime and and those types of uh, events aren't jurisdictional. So if you're not aware of something that's occurring in a, in a neighboring jurisdiction, then you might make long-term or strategic decisions that really aren't aren't supported by that information. So again, that's another way that um, 
uh, the interoperability or the lack thereof or the lack of integration can be dangerous. Um, I kind of like this slide. Why can't agencies exchange information? So fragmentation has created organizational islands. Um, it's the slide with the island here. Organizational islands. So you know the organ organizations are influenced by subculture budgets and community community priorities. So you know you know our community might be you know feel really strongly about. Um, uh, neighborhood watches or th you know certain types of um, prevention you know um, that, that occurs but our neighboring jurisdiction might feel differently so creating these islands and not having this consistency um, in information exchange and practices really creates um, these these islands that we talk about um, the entire criminal justice system tends to perform the function of information management exchange poorly because each island uh, enters information into the system separately, differently, and repeatedly. So what we enter in our jurisdiction about a particular event or particular person, we repeat that information or that might be duplicated information that's already entered in a, in a neighboring or in a county system or a state system or a federal system. So not having that integration causes those um, those three separately, differently, and repeatedly. Uh, the information gets entered. Uh, fragmentation results. Um, as state and local agencies adapt new ideas and technologies, they tend to adapt them on their own ways of doing business. So their processes might be different than our processes. So um, we, we tend to um, uh, adapt or do, their, do things on our own and not in a consistent manner. Uh, these agencies end up with assortment of systems, applications, databases, and communication schemes, often different from neighboring or even overlapping agencies. So, you know, as somebody that is, um, you know, adjacent to us in our jurisdiction, um, probably, and I can guarantee, I, I know this for a fact, do things quite differently than we do. And so that really, when the processes and the practices are different, it really creates a difficulty when it comes to time to exchange information even if both parties are willing to exchange information so um, what should integration look like so, I mean this is the, probably the the uh, $64,000 question here an integration uh, integrated excuse me criminal justice information system uh, sharing system must one fulfill the needs of the agency employing the system so if it doesn't work for us then then what is the point of having an integrated system and two it must address the needs of other agencies so it must be a system that works for everyone and if it doesn't work for everyone then people aren't going to buy in and there isn't going to be um, a, a cooperation with that system um, what should integration uh, system look like? For any system, uh, system integration to be successful, it must be founded on standards and data entry, protocols, policies, software, and hardware. So, you know, the, the key thing really is here is probably the first and third one. Data entry, how enter, a data is entered, um, well, I guess the first three, the protocol or the, um, the, the means by which, you know, those, the, that data is entered, and the policies. You know, we enter um, information on, on um, you know, a, a incident of certain type in a certain way, and that needs to be consistent in other agencies. The software and hardware part of those, those are going to be ones that, you know, there can be some variance there, but it's the standards of the pro or the protocols in which how that information is exchanged and how that information is, is um, disseminated is, is what's important. Um, integration. For these uh, tr transactions to be complete, uh, they need to be employ several different concepts: context and protocol. Context: um, an agreement between the agencies that exchange um, is is going to be about certain subjects. So the context of what, how that information is being exchanged, and then again, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the protocol, the rules on how that information is going to be exchanged and used. Um, information would be captured once and uh, and reused. Uh, during subsequent decision-making points uh, would have the ability to automatically query databases of other organizations um, so you know again that's important in the fact that you know can you imagine well uh, you, you know that that crime does not follow jurisdictional boundaries um, just because you know our city limit our county limit our township limit ends at at this line doesn't mean that somebody's not going to go another couple miles and and commit a very similar crime so exchanging that 
um, or being able to query surrounding databases to say, hey, is someone doing this type of crime with this type of, of MO? Um, so again, being able to query those. Um, would have the ability to pull and push only data that, that was needed um, and then have the ability to receive notifications. So um, not a notification that when you know, something occurs in a, in a neighboring jurisdiction that meets a query or, or a, a um, parameter that you've set for a question um, or when you're querying a database um, is important. And internet standards, uh, are internet standards a solution? Why aren't law enforcement agencies using web-based standards? Um, agencies um, only need certain portions of each each other's data. So, um, except um, databases are often 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 incompatible. Data fields are different. So again, this is talking about when 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 neighbor, neighboring jurisdictions one their practices, their policies, or procedures are different. But then also the underlying um, core of the databases that they have, the database schemas, the the structures of those databases, the fields. You know what we call you know. Maybe a complaint type might be, uh, you know, an incident type, and so understanding how those things mash up and mesh together, um, those are all um, um, also creative. So the solution that we see most extensively is an XML solution. XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. Um, it is a root markup language that is derived from uh, a similar to HTML. Um, language you know so we learned in, pre in previous chapters that HTML is hypertext markup language it's a text-based language it's a language that browsers understand and use to display data so extent uh, XML or extensible markup language is very similar there's tags and labels in this data so that when um, that information shared um, our complaint type then is put out there with a description then someone can say oh, okay that is our incident type so those when those XML uh, data is transferred or, or ex exchanged or shared, there is that common. It can be used to pass other binary data such as images. Um, it uses tags to identify information so um, disparate applications and systems can use easily recognize data. So again, talking about the incident versus complaint type um, uh, example. XML separates styles from, con uh, from content. So style is the way that agencies um, decide it wants data presented. Content is the actual, is the part of the, the total um, each picks for its own style. So it is it's the, the content part of that uh, total. Um, tactical communicate communications. There are two common tactical communi communication strategies. Uh, one is operational st uh, strategy that can improve communications between the different agencies. So um, going here. Um, Technical uh, technical solutions. So um, often you'll see, and um, in more populated um, counties, in that you'll see um, trunk radio systems that allow for uh, programming of each agency's frequencies into the radio systems um, and, and and vehicles of, of other agencies. So um, we do this quite frequently. Um, in, in our case, you know, we have a, a 800 megahertz trunk radio system. We have a system key. Then we share that key with uh, a few other people and they then can turn program for their agencies you know our frequencies into their radio system so then if we do have a common event that they can flip over to our you know um, one of our frequencies and we can communicate readily the gateway interfer interface is also it's a permanently installed or used to um, during major tactical events um, a, a good example of this is I know that Ohio the, um, State Patrol they have a vehicle that they will roll out to uh, incidents and they have a um, a gateway or a patch panel uh, uh, system that allows patching together of, of uh, completely different radio systems. Um, incident command system, ICS. Um, you know, I would imagine that you will see this more frequently. I know that um, since 9/11, um, there has been a a uh, concerted push by the federal government to to push out uh, incident command. Um, ICS and NIMS National Incident Management System training to um, um, all the state and local agencies so that there is a common language, a common um, practice, common procedures that are used when um, um, going through and um, on a li large site. I know that I've been through um, a couple different um, ICS training classes just a couple weeks ago, went through 
uh, resource training, which is resource unit leader training. So this is a more common um, practice and structure that's that's taking place. Um, agency partnerships are, are a big part of this. There are ways that agency partnerships can improve interoperability and exchange information of data. Um, direct pooling of physical resources, so shared resources, so um, we're all in the same system. So we pool our resources, we um, leverage our buying power with their buying power to, to, to create or purchase a system that is um, used in both agencies. Pooling data, not facilities, um, is another way that that occurs. Um, contract communications with larger agencies. This one is a good example. Um, you know, I mentioned just a couple slides ago that currently we have our own 800 megahertz radio system. It's an analog system. Um, Grove City is moving away from that. We are going to partner with Franklin County, the county that we reside in, to actually um, go with them to purchase a um, portion of the Marx system. So we will be on a Marx radio system. Um, um, the segmented portion of their system that we can have a little bit more control on. Um, so the MARC system is going to segment out one of their controllers here in Franklin County. So we'll be using that uh, system. So it's, it's, um, it's a good example of that. And then also create regional systems. So that in turn will create a larger regional system. I think there's several other agencies that are, are going along uh, in that agreement as well. Um, two ways of looking at uh, information integration partnerships. Horizontal par partnerships, so um, that is a partnership between agencies at the same level of government, so city governments with c other city governments, and then vertical partnerships, like with, which I just mentioned about the radio, involves agencies varying at, at varying levels, so us with a county, or and then us then with the state in terms of the mark system. So that is more of a vertical partnership than a horizontal partnership. Um, and a good what this leads to is, is the economies of scale. So based on economic theory, um, that the more you produce of a good, the less um, it costs for uh, each additional unit. So if we are pooling our stuff, so we're going with the county and, and several other townships together to make this purchase. So because we are buying more of a something, uh, more of a more units of something, we're going to get that at a, at a reduced cost. So the economies of scale. In government service, economies of scales can be realized by expanding the geographic boundaries of the service. Exactly what I'm talking about there. Uh, economies of scale combining technology resources, 85% of, of most state and local law enforcement budgets are personnel cost, and I can attest to that. That's the way it is in Grove City. Um, yeah, I know that uh, right now we're preparing budgets and you know we, we're looking at some of those budgets. I do know that personnel cost is the biggest uh, portion of their budgets, um, not equipment costs. So how many fewer people will it take to run uh, an operation will there be significant savings over the long term so if we are using the economies of scale then those monies that were dedicated to sort of towards some of those equipment costs can be redirected towards personnel uh, information sharing is the transfer of information from one system to another via um, an intermediate system uh, again we've talked about that pooling of resources uh, facilities um, uh, agencies agree to send the data to a central uh, data warehouse or a central system. Um, this does not so much address communications, but again, you know, my example of the radio systems is, is one way that, you know, and the MARC system in Ohio is one way that we're, we, we, we're trying to address that. Um, contract uh, information services can, uh, with a private vendor uh, or, or larger agencies, um, typically used in small municipal police departments, uh, contracts with a, um, a county law enforcement agency. So townships often will contract with the county to provide their law enforcement uh, um, uh, uh, functions in their township. And then there's some townships that will, will, will dedicate the resources to do it themselves. So um, that's an example of that. Um, for the for a predetermined fee, the large HC um, will conduct its PSAP or primary um, or public safety answering uh, point things. It'll do its CAD, computer uh, computer aided dispatch, radio system maintenance, and control access to the database. So when they contract that, you know those are the things that they will will, will spell out in those contracts or the the service level agreements that they they have with those other agencies. Um, a regional system. Agencies join. Uh, uh, agencies form joint communication projects, sometimes referred as intergovernmental agreements or IGAs. 
or joint powers of authority, JPAs. Um, we typically see more intergovernmental agreements or MOUs, memorandums of understanding um, between agencies and how um, information is shared or, or exchanged. Some agencies um, form uh, non-for-profit organizations and create and manage regional systems and that um, we'll see that happen from time to time. Um, so that's uh, that covers um, what we did um, in chapter 11 here so you see that there's no discussion board items this week so hope uh, you have a good week. Um, if you have any questions feel, excuse, wow, please feel free to contact me. I check my contact information under the information section on Blackboard. So hope you guys have a good week and um, see you next time. Thank you.